Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. This is Palm Sunday, week before Easter. Man, the year is going by so fast already. It seems like it was just January, right? So I'll be honest, I don't have another Palm Sunday sermon to preach. I went back through my notes, I began to study it even more, and I was like, man, I have preached every single angle about Palm Sunday. So I'm not going to do a Palm Sunday sermon today, but I believe it's going to be great, you're going to enjoy it. Last week, my friend Brandon uh, Stewart was here, Pastor Brandon, I feel like he did a great job. We had an awesome time with him the weekend. Him and his family were in town, and then on Monday, he stayed back with our staff, and we did a staff training uh, on leadership, leading from the second chair, and man, we had such an amazing time uh, with Pastor Brandon. If you're watching online today, today is our first weekend launching what we're calling our online campus. Pastor John Mark is now our online pastor for our online campus, so during different parts of the service, instead of showing what's happening in the room, the camera's going to switch live to him, where he's going to speak directly live to the online audience, pastor them a little bit differently, and then come back to our services. So it's going to look a little bit different. He'll be in the chat room, all service. If you uh, need prayer, if you need to connect with somebody, Pastor John Mark's going to be that touch point person, and we have other online hosts as well. Now, I just want to give you really quick, like, why we're... I mean, we've been doing online church, I think, from like 2007 or 2008. We've been doing a very, very long time before online church was sexy. Uh, we had a camera in the room, and it was to our website. Uh, we didn't have anything really cool. Like, we had an iCal script that, like, triggered the online feed to a camera that was unmanned. I mean, it was just ugly. But we've been doing it a very long time. And the purpose of online was for people who were sick people who couldn't make it to church, or people who were out of town or had moved away and they couldn't find a good church. Online church was never designed for a person who lives three minutes from the church building. Okay? And, and really, we're doing our analytics. The majority of people that watch us online are within a 10-mile radius. Right? That's not really what it was designed for. But we do understand, and my parents have said the same thing. My parents now live in Florida, and they're like, Mike, there's no church like family church within 30 minutes of my church. Like, we have to stay connected with you online and get what you guys are doing there. So that's really what it was designed for, okay? So really, we want you to be here. If you're within 15, 20 miles, we really want you to be here in the room connecting with the local body. But for those of you that can't, Pastor John Mark is going to do an amazing job pastoring those who are online. Amen? Amen? So here's today's big idea. Today's big idea is this. It is easier to obtain than it is to maintain. Has anybody ever heard that statement before? It's easier to obtain than it is to maintain. Buying new stuff is actually as addictive as any other addiction that you can have. We love buying new stuff. We love starting new projects. We love starting new hobbies. Anybody love new hobbies? So here's what happens to me. I do have a very addictive personality. Um, I haven't played, I hadn't played golf in like 10 years. And these guys, they said, Mike, you got to go play golf with us. Like, I don't, I don't golf. Like, come on, man, you got to go play golf with us. I said, like, I don't golf. Like, Mike, you got to go play golf. I said, fine, fine, I'll go play golf. And they put me on a golf team and we won the tournament. So guess who's a golfer now? Right? So yesterday I had to go get fitted for golf clubs, and I'm like, I'm all in, man. But I also understand, like, if I'm going to start a new hobby, like an old hobby has to kind of go on the shelf. Because you can only do so many things. Right? You can only have so many hobbies. But we love it. Maintaining new things is, a, is fun, it's exciting, but finding time to do all those things can be challenging. My concept today is it's easier to obtain than it is to maintain. 1 Peter 1, 
1, 3 through 5 says this, Blessed be to God our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again in a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance. There's an inheritance. There's something that's ours. That is imperishable. That God has set aside something for us that cannot perish. It cannot be torn away. Undefiled, unfading, kept where? In heaven. Kept in heaven. Not in a bank that can go bankrupt. You guys get that, right? Well, it just happened? Yes? We're where? Okay, I need a little bit. I need a little bit today. Just a tiny bit. A little, a little tiny bit. Okay. That was good, right? Not in a bank that can go belly up. Something that's better than FDIC insured. He's got this promise for us kept in heaven. Who by God's power are being guarded. We got a bodyguard on this too. We got a bodyguard on our inheritance. A bodyguard on our stuff. Through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in time past. All right, we're going to get into all this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today as we get into your word that we can be focused on your word. It's easy to be distracted by things around us. Help us to be focused today. Holy Spirit, open the eyes of our understanding. Enlighten us to your truth. Show us things to come in Jesus' name. Amen. Has anybody ever heard of buyer's remorse? Have you ever had buyer's remorse? You bought something and immediately regretted buying it. Yes? All the time? That means you're an impulsive buyer. Okay. So this one time, there was this car that I just had to have. And I didn't tell first service what it is, but I'll tell you what it is, okay? I just had to have this car. It had just come out. It was called the Dodge Nitro. This thing was sick. I was amped. I'm like, yo, I got to have this it's like SUV, kind of looked like a Jeep, just dodging that. I was like, I got to have this thing. It came with 22-inch chrome rims. I was like, oh, this thing just looks sick. It already looked like it was dropped, big rims. I was all into this thing. Man, I was amped up. I'm so amped. I'm so in love with this car. One of the things I love to do is wash cars. I do. I love washing a car. It's relaxing to me. I've got my whole garage set up to wash cars and to detail them. i got all the stuff hanging on the wall just right. Like, I'm into this. Like, cars are my thing. I buy this Dodge Nitro. I get it home. I'm amped up to wash this thing. You start washing it from the top, work your way down, windshield. Then you work your way from the front to the back of the car. If you never wash a car, that's how you wash a car, top, down, front, back. <laughs> okay. Got to do the windows inside and out. If you don't do the windows, the car's not clean. But you need to spend time on the wheels. The wheels are like a nice pair of shoes. If the wheels look clean, the car can still be dirty, but it looks good. Come on, I'm helping somebody out, changing somebody's life. You know what I'm talking about, right? The wheels got to look good. So I got my little rolling stool, roll my stool out, sit down on it, start to wash the rims, and there's a problem. There's a problem. I'm immediately, up. my heart sinks. Like I'm literally it's a panic attack. I go back to my invoice of my, of my, of my car, of the uh, Dodge Nitro, and I'm looking through blah, 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 22-inch chrome clad rims. I'm mortified. Do you know what chrome clad rims mean? Hubcaps! <laughs> They're plastic! It's metal underneath, but it got plastic on top, and it's like spray painted chrome. That's, I'm done with the car. I, I'm legit. I'm done, I was done with the car. I think I had the car nine months or ten months. I had, I had to get rid of it. I had to. Mortifying to me. Mortifying. Because I just had to have that car. And then when I found out, it was impure. <laughs> it was full of sin. I couldn't, I couldn't have it. I know, I know that's extreme. I know, I know it's extreme, but that's my personality. It's how I am, right? I had buyer's remorse the second I washed that thing and I found out I had fake rims. I went online and I looked up the 10 most regretted purchases. Let's see. Have you ever bought any of these? Number one most regretted, a timeshare. Second, expensive weddings. Yeah, it got quiet first service too. <laughs> See, there's one or two reasons why you regret an expensive wedding. One, you divorced. Now it's a full waste of money. 
Or two, you now realize after 30 years of marriage that that could have been a nice down payment on a house. And now you ain't even friends with nobody that even came to your wedding. Boats. They say the best day of your life in boating is the day you buy it and the day you sell it. Uh, Number three, expensive cars. Number five, lottery tickets because you obviously didn't win. Number six, big houses. Number seven, swimming pools. Number eight, designer clothing. Number nine, exercise equipment. Do you know when people bought mad exercise equipment? During COVID. I can't go to the gym. Oh my God, I can't go to the gym. For the three times you went a year, I got to buy gym equipment. It's all for sale on the Facebook Marketplace right now. Dumbbells, Peloton. You get a Peloton for 500 bucks on Amazon uh, Facebook Marketplace right now. Selling all this stuff. Gym equipment and cheap furniture. That's a regret. You went and bought that Ikea dresser. Three weeks later, it's sitting like this. No one can ever get those little round things that turn just right, right? Cheap furniture. What do all these things have in common? Yes. Once you buy them, minus the lottery tickets, once you buy them, you have to maintain them. Once you buy them, you have to maintain. You bought that boat you just had to have And after you took it out into one lake or one ocean or whatever it was, you get it home and now you have to wash it for four hours. You got to maintain the wax on it. You got to make sure that your upholstery doesn't mold. Who wants all this, right? Just go rent one for 300 bucks for the day. And then the headache of maintain, because it's easier to obtain then maintain. Like, you're about to buy this brand new car you just have to have. All these endorphins are running through your body when you sign that contract. But the excitement is short-lived when you have to do the first oil change for $300. Right? Now we have to maintain this thing. And before, everyone's like, no, I love maintaining my stuff. Let me go walk through the parking lot and see if we like maintaining our cars. Let me... Oh, my car looks good. Let me open the trunk and see if you just threw everything in it. Let's see how much dog fur is all over the carpet. Right? Come on, I'm just throwing some stuff out. Now nah, my car is, is, is spotless. Okay, you got any dishes in your kitchen sink? How's your landscaping right now? How's your backyard? You picked up all the dog poop? Come on, just throw some stuff out. Because it's easier to, like, get this stuff than it is to maintain this stuff. We don't fix our appliances anymore. The Maytag repairman is on unemployment. Your blender breaks. No one wants to wait to get their blender fixed. They throw it in the trash. They go to Target, buy a new one. Right? Even if it's under warranty, by the time you box it up, put it back in a box, ship it back to China, have it fixed and sent back. I just go to Target, get a new one. It's quick. It's easy. This same emotion and the same concept and these same actions have crept into the church. It's easier to obtain than it is to maintain our salvation. Before you know where, you don't know where I'm going. You do not know where I'm going with this, okay? So don't prejudge what I just said. It's just a fact. Someone gets saved on Sunday, I give my life to Jesus, they live for Satan all week. Live for Satan all week. I'll get saved on Sunday. Live for Satan all week. Get saved on Sunday. Live for Satan all week. Because I'll just obtain it. I'll just get saved again instead of maintain it. Why? Because we all suck at maintaining stuff. We all buy too much stuff to possibly maintain it all. That's why you got a junk drawer. Why you got a junk drawer? To throw all the stuff you just had to have in a drawer. People got storage units, storage units to pay a monthly payment to store their junk. It's easier to obtain than it is to maintain. You still don't know where I'm going with the sermon, okay? Just hold on, hold on. Christians have this belief and this idea, if I do bad, I am bad. If I don't read my Bible, if I don't pray, I lost my salvation, or at the very least, I broke it. And we don't fix things anymore, we just replace them, so I need to get saved again. 
because it's easier to obtain than it is to maintain. If I want to honor God, then, I'm still speaking about the problem, if I want to honor God, then I need to obtain more. I hear people say this, if I just read my Bible more, if I just prayed more, if I just obtained more of God, I'd be a better Christian. No, you wouldn't. Look at all these Bibles I got. <laughs> I promise you, I had to have that Bible right there. I have never opened it. I have never opened this brand new ESV Bible. Why? Because I got the internet. But I had to have it. I saw it on ChristianBooks.com. Brand new Bible coming out. But if I get more Bibles, I'll read my Bible. No, you won't. No, you won't. Yeah, but if I get a Bible, I understand. I'll read it. No, you won't. Because you're not trying now. That's the whole thing, right? When I get rich, then I'll be generous. No, you won't, because you're not generous. Because it's not in your heart. You're not a giver. Right? We just, I'm just, this sermon today is just to help you be self-aware. If I get more Bibles, I'll read the Bible more. No, you won't. You just have to get a bigger bookshelf to hold the Bible. Then you got to go dust them. But we suck at maintaining, so they're going to be dirty. Come on, somebody. You still don't know where I'm going with this. You think you do, but you don't, because I'm not being judgmental. Ephesians 1.13. And you also were included in Christ. So you are in Christ. You are in Christ when you heard the message of the truth. So when were you part of Christ? When were you in Christ? When you heard. What comes by hearing? Faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? So you had faith or you were included in Christ when you heard the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, okay, we got to look at the grammar. When you believed, comma, you were marked. I love that because that sounds like tattoos to me. <laughs> when you, it's not, but I'm just, I'm saying, I just like to think it is. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. When you believed, you were marked by him, with him, with a seal. The promise of the Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. This is actually banking terms. Our inheritance until the day of redemption of those who are God's. What? You're his. You're not even your own. You're his possession. Do you think that he knows how to lose stuff? He don't know how to lose stuff. You know the whole story of he'll leave the 99 and go after the one, and thank God he came for me when I was backslidden. That's not talking about you. That ain't talking about no backslidden Christian he's going after. He didn't leave 99 unsaved people to go for another unsaved person. He left 99 people who were safe, sealed, marked, secure to go after the one that never put their faith in Jesus. <laughs> Once you're his, you're his. He don't lose you. He don't give you back. He don't put you up for adoption. You are God's possession to the praise of his glory. You were marked with a seal, the promise. Oh, let's go on to another one. 2 Corinthians 1.21, you're going to get me preaching. And it is God who establishes you in Christ. It is God who establishes you in Christ and has anointed you. And who has also put his seal on you and given you the Holy Spirit in your heart as a guarantee. See, there's that word again, as a guarantee, as a warranty, as a guarantee. You have God's guarantee that you are his. We don't get that. We don't get that, right? Come on, I'm waiting for someone to connect the dots. If you are his, then whose job is it to maintain your salvation?
if you're his possession, if he owns you, who maintains a possession? The owner. I know, I know, I know, I know. You know why, you know why we don't like this? Because we're all works-minded. We've all been taught to be works-minded. I've got to do more. I've got to buy more. So we have more Bibles. We go to more prayer meetings. But we still ain't good Christians. I know. You don't. I think you're starting to get where I'm going. So let me show you this. I was taught that the seal here, you've been sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, is a lot like a Ziploc bag. A Ziploc bag, because when it's sealed, it's sealed. You're locked in. How many trust the seal on a Ziploc bag? You trust it. Yes? Now, do you trust it more because it has the name Ziploc on it and not Walmart? I'll tell you the truth, I don't know that I would trust a Walmart, like a knockoff Ziploc bag. Seriously. But it says Ziploc, so I got to trust it, right? So you guys trust it? You put stuff in it, put soup in them, put potato salad, arroz con pollo, penil, chuleta, mofongo. Ah, tu no sabes mi español. <laughs> eh, eh. Listen, man, I love me some comida, so I know my Ziploc baggies. Do you trust a Ziploc bag? Huh? Who trusts a Ziploc bag? You trust a Ziploc bag? No, no, I'm going to put this over your head. Do you still trust a Ziploc bag? Starting to lose trust. If I said to you, I'm going to put this Ziploc bag over your head upside down, would you like to check that seal first? Right? Huh? Right? And this is what happens in our Christianity. I trust that I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit, but let me just check, make sure. Oh, let me just check again. Oh, let me just check again. And I'm going to check again, and I'm going to check again. Because sometimes, man, have you ever, like, thought you sealed the bag, but then it was like crossed, and like it went out of the cross and then came back in the, and then like, do I feel sealed? Does it feel, do I feel saved? Do I feel like it's in the right, is it right? Like, because it's all right that I trust it over here, but do I trust it over here? Do, uh, see now, first service, the bag had a hole in it by accident and it went everywhere. <laughs> No doubt it was bad. <laughs> this is what happens with our salvation, though. I know, I know what the Bible says, but let me just check the seal. And we <laughs> preached it. We preached it, too. No, make, check, make sure. Make sure, make sure. And that's not even what the Bible's talking about. That's not even what the seal means. When the Bible says that you have been sealed, you've been marked with a seal, the promise of the Holy Spirit, it's literally talking about a king's seal. A king, when he would write a letter, he'd put the envelope, fold it, put the envelope. He would take wax, melt it, pour the hot wax onto the seam of the envelope. He would then take his insignia ring that only he had the authority to wear, and he would stamp that ring into the wax, sealing that envelope, which means that it could not be opened until it reached its destination. It could not be peeked inside of. The secrets could not be shared. That seal could not be the only one who had authority to open that seal was the recipient. The Bible says that you have been sealed with such a guarantee until the day you get to heaven. Amen. Has anybody in here self-copyrighted a song before? Self-copyrighted a song. So there's this thing called a poor man's copyright, okay? A poor man's copyright is this. You write your song out, you've got your words, you've got the, the, the music, you've got the lyrics, you put it in an envelope, you seal it, you mail it to yourself. You mail it to yourself. 
That way it has a time stamp on it. It has a legal stamp, right? You can't mess with the mail. Like, you could go aboard a baby, but don't touch someone's mail! You go to jail, touch someone's mail, mailbox, theft. But it's a legal document now. It's been stamped with a timestamp from the postal service, which means as long as you never open it, you wrote that song before that timestamp. That song is yours. No one else can use that song, those lyrics, those words, because you have documentation that you wrote that, right? Only you can open that document because it was sent to you. You mailed it to yourself. That's the greatest thing about God. When he stamped us with a seal, it says that one day he will receive us to himself. Only God, only God can open that seal. Guess what? You can't open the seal because you're in the envelope sealed by him. Your actions, your deeds, your behavior cannot break the seal. How foolish would it be? Now we're going to go logic. How foolish would it be for God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, to send his son to die on a cross for something you could destroy? That's the most self-righteous. Listen. Listen. For you to personally be able to undo the cross makes you more powerful than God. Like, that's just logic, y'all. If you can undo what God did, it makes you more powerful than God. You can't. He sealed you. Him who knew no sin became sin that we might be made, he made us, the righteousness of God in Christ. You didn't make you righteous, he did. You didn't die on the cross, he did. So now here comes the question. There's two sides of it. Either at salvation or praying the prayer of salvation or whatever, you've never gotten saved. You never actually did believe in your heart. You never did put your faith in Jesus. And so you keep living the life of the world you go through the motions, you repeat a prayer, but you don't believe it, so you never got saved. That's a possibility. That's a possibility. The Bible says that there's going to be people that say, Lord, Lord, I went to church every Sunday. I put the right cologne on and I dressed up. And he says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. That's a possibility. There's also those who are saved, but you're in infancy. You're a baby Christian. You've not grown in your faith. You own a lot of Bibles, but you never read them. Right? You don't go to Bible study, you don't do an online Bible study or growth or devotionals, and so you look a lot like the world. You look just like a sinner, except you have a place in eternal life. Then there are those who have a relationship with God and are growing and thriving, and they love the joy of their salvation. But God would never give us a system that we had to maintain because he knows that we stink at maintaining things. You don't maintain your salvation. He does. It's his salvation. He saved you. You have been bought with a price. You've been bought with a price. You're his possession. You're his. He said, you did not choose me. I chose you. From the foundation of the earth, I chose you. You are his. But there is a part to play. So here's the catch. I know you're waiting for the other shoe to drop. Here it is. There is a part to play. And I'm going to jump all the way in my notes, guys, down to Matthew 22, verse 37. There's one thing that you are to maintain. And he said this, here's the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Okay? Here's the problem with that verse. Love the Lord my God with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind, but I just bought a boat. And I've got two days a week off. Saturday and Sunday. I need to put, use my boat. Great day to go on the boat. Sunday morning, man. You go on that boat. Right? Our hobbies, our possessions, the things that we have to buy and stuff many times become the focus of our heart, soul, and mind. See, our love 
is the thing that we are required to maintain. Love the Lord your God with your whole being. And then he says, but then there's a second commandment that's a lot like it. Love your neighbor. Love. Man, doggone, isn't it so hard to maintain love? I mean, I love you as long as you love me. I love you as long as you're nice to me. But man, don't take my parking spot. Don't cut me off on the highway. Huh? Don't let your dog keep going to the bathroom in my front yard. Love is ours to maintain. Loving God and loving others. We have that responsibility to maintain that love. No, you cannot maintain your salvation. You didn't earn it. We sing the song, I didn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you gave it. We sing it so easily, but do we believe it? No, you didn't earn salvation, it's not yours to maintain, but love is. There's somebody in here that your health could exponentially change for the better if you would just forgive somebody. That there's, a, there's an anger and a hatred and a wounding in your heart so deep that it literally makes you sick because you just can't forgive. See, love and hate can't be in the same place. We can't be in the same abode. The only thing that we are that we are allowed to hate is sin. Do you love your neighbor? Do you love the Lord your God? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. See, this doesn't prove that. Having a lot of Bibles doesn't prove my love for God. Woo! I know. What are you doing with the word that you possess? What are you doing with the knowledge you possess? How do you treat your neighbor? Does your neighbor know that you have the secret to eternal life living on the inside of you? Like you literally have the answer to the world's problem living on the inside of you, but do people know it? Do people have access to it? Healing is in your hands. Do you hold back praying for someone? See what I'm saying? There is a responsibility to this Christian life. But we get hung up on maintaining our salvation. That's why many people just give up. I stink at maintaining it. I stink at maintaining everything. So, And I think COVID gave a lot of people a reason to just give up on church give up on their relationship with God altogether, right? So I, knew, I know you thought you knew where I was going. I'm not judging at all. I'm just here to tell you that God would never create a system of something that we would have to maintain when we never maintain anything. He maintains it. He maintains your salvation. But you maintain your love. You, you maintain your joy. If you don't have joy in your life, that's not because God's not good. It's not because everyone's na nasty to you. It's not everyone else's problem. It's yours. You can be joyful in the midst of adversity. You can be full. Of, it is your job to ensure that you put a smile on your face every day. No one else can do that for you. It's no one else's job. Well, if I didn't come home and the kids are going crazy and just piss me off. No, they, no one can do that. You're just an angry person. You need help. You need a counselor. Well, I just need a, a few glasses of wine so I can relax before I have to deal with everybody. No, no, you're, you have an alcoholic problem. Don't put that on anybody else. Don't put that, just own, own it. No one's judging you. I love, listen, I'm an addict. I deal with it every day. That's why I can preach to you straight out. It is my job to say no to those things. It is my job to look at myself in the mirror every morning and say, you are going to be happy today. You're going to have joy today. That's my job. That's your job. You choose to be joyful. Yeah, but what do you do when everyone, you know, just makes you crazy? You get up and walk away. You don't make it someone else's problem. You get up and go take a breath. Go get some oxygen. Go, go, go change position. But that's no one else's job. Don't make that someone else. Don't make someone codependent because you're nasty. It's your job 
to maintain that. And how do you do that? How do you do that? Let's close this out. By partnering with the Holy Spirit. You have to partner with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the peace that surpasses understanding. The Holy Spirit is our comforter, our guide. Listen, man, I couldn't do it. I could not control myself if I didn't have the Holy Spirit. If I didn't pray in tongues and build myself up in my most holy faith, I wouldn't be able to do those. I wouldn't be able to manage that. I wouldn't be able to maintain the joy of my salvation. I have to partner with the Holy Spirit. But you can't partner with the Holy Spirit if you don't have the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that the Holy Spirit comes and makes his dwelling place within you. God receives a child back to himself again. And he puts his guarantee within us, the Holy Spirit, and he seals us up with a promise of salvation. If you're here today and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I'd love to invite you to do that today. I'm turning the service online over to Pastor John Mark to lead you in a prayer as well. But if you're in the room today and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we'd love to partner with you and pray that prayer of salvation today. And listen, man, today, make it count. Like, believe it today. Believe it. The Bible says, with your heart you believe, with your mouth confession is made unto salvation. You believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. Believing in your heart something that I can't do for you, I can't convince you, I can't prove God to you. That's where faith comes in. Faith. I believe. But then you say it with your mouth. You say it out loud with a confession of faith. And if, if you've never done that before, I want to offer that to you today. You do not have to do it again if you've done it once before in your life. But if you've never done it in faith, I invite you to do it today in faith. And the prayer goes to this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me, accepting me, and coming into my life. I receive you now. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.